welcome my dear viewers into the world of botany the plant science in reproductive morphology there is an important topic that is called flower this is kvs durga prasad head of department of botany hindu college is introducing the topic of flower in reproductive morphology this flower is a very very important topic the terminology of the flower is very much required to identify a plant in taxonomy for that it is very much essential to know the description of a flower here i will be introducing the various terms of the flower you carefully follow the various terms here you are watching the parts of a flower a flower has a stalk what it is called the pedicel of course there are there will be flowers without pedicel a flower with a pedicel is called pedicellate and a flower without it is said to be called sessile it finishes with a seed the seed of the flower and what it is called the thalamus or otherwise called the torus which bears all the parts of a flower a typical flower will be having the sepals the petals the male reproductive structures called the andrisium or the stamens and then the central female reproductive structure the gynesium or otherwise called pistil i repeat this is the thalamus or the receptacle the sepal the petal then about the female male reproductive structure with the filament and anther called stamen then the central female reproductive structure with a swollen base called the ovary uh, elongated structure called the style and a flattened structure called the stigma which receives the which receives the pollen hence it is called the pistil or otherwise called the carpel or otherwise called the megasporophyll and uh, uh, the whorl of carpels is called the gynesium these sepals and petals these together called non essential organs or the perianth members i repeat the sepals and petals are otherwise called non essential organs the stamens and the carpels are called the uh, essential organs once again here also you are watching the same the parts of a flower but i am now i am explaining the parts of a flower through a floral diagram this is a quite important diagram uh, where you will be seeing it regularly in the case of taxonomy so my dear viewers i am telling you that this is a topic very much related to the taxonomy so in a taxonomy this is popularly called the floral diagram it has the various whorls of uh, floral parts the outermost whorl is called the sepal the sepals will be represented here outermost then followed by the petals the second row second whorl cycle then followed by the andrisium and innermost is the uh, carpels the whorl of carpels the gynesium that is the ts of ovary in fact of course a flower has two faces my dear viewers a flower has two faces this is the axis and this is the bract from the axil of the bract the flower arises from the axil of the bract the flower arises and uh, the side that is facing the bract the side that is facing the bract is said to be called the anterior end here also this both are the same diagrams this is the bract this is the axis this is said to be called the anterior end and the opposite end or the side that is facing the axis is said to be called the posterior end dear viewers so thus a flower has an anterior end and a posterior end in a floral diagram how how it has to be represented this is a floral diagram this is the axis what here it has been the, the this spot is so this end is said to be called this end is said to be called the posterior end and the opposite end here the bract has to be mentioned and this end is said to be called the anterior end i repeat this part of the flower is said to be called the posterior end and this part of the flower is said to be called the anterior end thus you have to describe the the posterior and anterior ends to a flower then flower is nothing but a modified shoot flower is a, a modified shoot like any other uh, uh, vegetative part the stem the nodes the internodes the leaves the flower all the floral parts are nothing but the leaves but modified for the sake of the sexual reproduction that trans the transition it can be seen in the case of nymphia where a normal vegetative leaf turning into sepal sepal into petal petal into andrisium and uh, the innermost structures so on the transition is seen another evidence uh, 
If ever it is a, a normal shoot, then it should have the nodes and internodes. Yes, it has nodes. Calyx is a one node. Coral is another node. Andresium another node. Carpels another node. Then where are and internodes? Yes, they are compressed. They are condensed. They are reduced. But sometimes in certain flowers, those internodes are seen as an elongations in between the respective organs. My dear viewers, here you can see them. This is in between the sepals and petals. These are the petals. These are the sepals. An internodal elongation you are watching here and what it is called anthophore in the case of lichenis and selin. An internodal elongation is seen as a stalk in between these are the petals and this is the andrisium. Hence it is said to, be, said to be called androphore. Internodal elongation as a stalk between the petals and an andrisium. It is said to be called androphore in the case of uh, gynandropsis. Similarly, internodal elongation, these are all uh, stamens. This is the gynesium. An elongation is seen in between the andrisium and gynesium. Hence, it is called gynophore. You can see it in the case of caparis. An internodal elongation is seen between the non-essential organs and essential organs. That is between perianth members and uh, essential organs. Hence, it is said to be called gynandrophore in the case of passiflora. Even you could see the internodal elongation in between the carpels and what it is called carpophore. My dear viewers, this, this, this anthophore, androphore, gynophore, gynandrophore, carpophore are the best evidences to say that flower is a modified shoot. These are all internodal elongations. Okay then. How are these floral parts arranged on thalamus? There are three types. A cyclic, spirocyclic and cyclic. This is the most primitive method and these are highly advanced and this is an intermediate stage. Thalamus is elongated over which the, all the floral parts are arranged in a spiral manner and what it is a, cyc a cyclic, a very primitive feature seen in ranunculus. And uh, here the sepals and petals are in whorls but whereas andresium and gynesium are arranged in spirals. Hence, it is said to be called spirocyclic uh, or otherwise called hemicyclic in the case of anonesi members, anona, polyaltea, atrobotis. But in, in advanced conditions, it will be not like that. The sepals, the petals, the andresium and the carpels all are arranged in cycles or in whorls. Hence, the, such a flower is said to be called cyclic. Maybe tetracyclic, pentacyclic, so on. Here the sepals, the petals, the andresium and the corolla and, and the carpels. Hence, it is uh, a tetracyclic. And uh, that is the advanced condition and you watch what you are watching that is a uh, hibiscus. Then, mirosity. What is mirosity? The number of floral parts existing in each oral. Dear viewers, the number of floral parts existing in each oral is said to be called mirosity. If the number is similar, it is called isomerous. If the number is dissimilar, it is said to be called anisomerous. Generally, we take into the consideration the sepals and petals. Here you are watching, there are three members, three petals, hence it is called trimerous. And if ever it is four, it is said to be called tentromerous. If ever it is five, it is called pentomerous. So the trimerous is a, usually a feature of monocots. This pentomerous and tetromerous, that means five sepals and five petals, or four sepals and four petals, is said to be called tetromerous and pentomerous respectively, and that is a feature of uh, dicots. Here you are watching isomerous. Then iso anisomerous, trimerous, tetromerous, and pentomerous. Tetromerous is a feature of brassica. Trimerous is a feature of monocots. You can best example you can say ilium. Pentomerous hibiscus. Tetromerous brassica. So on. The mirosity means the existence of perianth members in each oral. Then symmetry. Basing on the symmetry, the flowers are classified into three types: actinomorphic, zygomorphic, and asymmetric. What you are watching on the monitor. On the screen, the actinomorphic flower. A flower can be cut into T colors in any plane and such a flower is said to be called actinomorphic or otherwise called regular flower. A typical hibiscus uh, is the best example of datura or you can quote brassica. The flower can be cut into two equal vertical offs in any vertical plane, in any vertical plane. And zygomorphic, a fabacin flower, a typical fabacin flower that can be cut only in one plane, that anterior posterior plane. Hence, uh, it can be represented as zygomorphic. In floral formula, it will be represented like this. Zygomorphic flower means a flower can be divided into two equal halves in only in one plane. And such a flower is said to be called zygomorphic fabacin flower. 
and this is a canna indica which cannot be cut to take collapse in any vertical plane and what such a flower is said to be called asymmetric dear viewers once again you are watching the same ectomorphic zygomorphic and asymmetric canna indica ectomorphic zygomorphic once again the same slide now coming to the sexuality this is another important aspect Flower usually possesses both androecium and gynecium. Such a flower is said to be called bisexual and it is a complete flower. This is a quite regular phenomenon. Um, a hibiscus and datura, both androecium and gynecium existing in the same flower. But if ever, if ever either the gynecium or the uh, stamen in between these two, any one is absent and such a flower is said to be called unisexual flower and such a flower is said to be called imperfect flower. Unisexual flowers. You'll be watching it again. Here in this case, this is a bisexual flower, but this is a unisexual flower with only stamens. Such a flower is said to be called staminate. And this is a flower, once again, unisexual, without stamens, only gynecium. What such a flower is said to be called pistillate. So the unisexual flowers are of two types, pistillate and uh, staminate flowers. And I'm introducing one more term in unisexual flowers. Of course, this is a bisexual. But unisexual flowers, there are two terms, dear viewers, monoecious and dioecious. A complicated thing to remember. What does it mean? Monoecious means both staminate and pistillate flowers. A plant posing, these two are unisexual flowers. They are not, it is not bisexual. This is a staminate flower. This is a pistillate flower. In floral diagram, when floral form light will be represented like this. This is a pistillate and this is a staminate. Both lying on the same plant. Best example is quokas, ficus. In all these things, uh, uh, inflorescence mean, existing, euphorbia also. So in these cases, the male and the female flowers existing on the same plant, what such condition is said to be called monoecious, best example, Cocos nucifera. But whereas the male flowers and the female flowers, these are the female flowers on one plant and male flowers on another plant. And this is dioecious, dioecious. That is existence of the male and female flowers on two different plants. What that phenomenon is said to be called dioecious. We can quote the best example of Valicinaria and even also the Boracis. My dear viewers, here we are entering into another important term. Basing on the shape of the thalamus and, uh, and the existence of the gynecium and the rest of the floral parts varies. And accordingly, there are three types of flower. Hypogynous, perigynous and epigynous. Hypogynous, perigynous and epigynous. I will explain it through diagram. Here are three important diagrams. This is hypogynous, perigynous and epigynous. How can how we have to differentiate it? The thalamus is elongated or conical shape and gynecium is present at the apex. And the rest of the floral parts, what I mean to say is andrecium, the petals and the, and the, uh, and the calyx. They will be below the level of the gynecium. And what such a flower is said to be called hypo. Gynous. Hypo means below. What is below? The rest of the floral parts are present below the level of the gynecium. That's hypogynous. A typical datura or a hibiscus. What is epigynous? Thalamus is a deep cup shape. Deep cup shape in which the gynecium, the ovary of it is deeply inserted. The rest of the floral parts are coming above the level of the gynecium. Hence it is said to be called epigynous. You can see it in the case of cucurbita. Tridax. Thalamus is deep cup shape and ovary is deeply seated. Rest of the floral parts present above the level of the gynecium. And thalamus is saucer shaped or concave and both the gynecium and the floral parts lying at the same level. And what this is called perigynous. This is highly advanced primitive and this is highly advanced condition. And here the ovary is said to be called superior. Here the ovary is said to be called inferior. Here the ovary is said to be called semi-inferior or semi-superior. And thus that is the type of flower hypogynous. Ovary is superior, ovary is inferior, and ovary, uh, perigynous ovary is semi superior, and uh, ovary is uh, inferior. Those are the three things hypogynous, perigynous, and epigynous. Very important uh, terms. Now, let us go and see each, every, each and every part of the flower. To begin with, the bract. Bract is a small scaly appendage from whose axle the flower arises. Bract is a small scaly appendage from whose axle the flower arises. It protects the flower in bud condition. A flower with bract is called bracteate. Suppose a fabation flower is having a bract, hence it is a bracteate flower. Sometimes the bract is absent and what such a flower is said to be called a bracteate. These bracts sometimes undergo some modifications. The originally the role of bract is to protect the flower in bud condition. Sometimes the bracts modify into petals like structure. We will be coming across this flower quite regularly. This is called bougainvillea. 
in bougainvillea what is the what are the attractive structures are nothing but bracts so hence they are called petaloid bracts we can quote bougainvillea and also poinsettia usually a single bract is present but horala bracts are seen here my dear viewers you can see this in the case of uh, many members of asteraceae like a tagetus chrysanthemum helianthus and what it is called involucra i repeat what is involucra horala bracts sometimes the bract completely envelops the inflorescence in the case of spadix inflorescence and what it is called spathe and here also you are watching the spathe in the case this is called case of coccus this is the case of musa so these three are the, the bract modifications apart from bract we have bracteoles usually two bracteoles are present on either side of the flower on the pedicel in the case of dicots and one in the case of monocot a flower with a bracteole is said to be called bracteolate or without it is said to be called a bracteolate but in the case of uh, malvaceae members this is hibiscus these bracteoles this is these are the, the sepals and these are the bracteoles so horala bracteoles are present in the floral diagram it will be represented like this my dear viewers horala bracteoles here also you can watch it is said to be called epicalis an important term in the case of malvaceae i repeat the horala bracteoles is said to be called epicalyx feature of malvasi or hibiscus now we are entering into the actual floral parts the sepals and petals together called the perianth or otherwise called non essential organs or otherwise called the uh, chlamydiae here it is a flower with the perianth is said to be called chlamydias but without it is called a chlamydias yes there are plants without sepals and petals the best example is a uh, uh, euphorbia and poinsettia with the uh, cyathem inflorescence each stamen is a uh, the, here we don't find the sepals and petals and what such a flower is said to be called a chlamydias but a uh, flower with perianth is said to be called chlamydia this chlamydia is again of two types monochlamydias and dichlamydias if it is having only one horal of perianth one one horal no no different differentiation just one horal it is said to be called monochlamydias as in the case of echinanthus and amaranthus but if ever it is having two horals it is said to be called dichlamydias dichlamydias and if the two horals are discriminated as sepal and a petal it is said to be called heterochlamydias usually you can see it in the case of dicots best example the tura and hibiscus but in the case of monocots especially in liliaceae there are two horals of perion but not differentiated not discriminated as sepal and petal what they are called tepals best example uh, liliaceae members so accordingly these are all various terms one has to come across these are eclamidias monochlamidias dichlamidias homochlamidias and heterochlamidias heterochlamidias means two horals of perion differentiated as sepals and petals two horals not differentiated into sepals petals perion in one horal and peri without perion eclamidias means here we are watching this is homochlamidias condition in tulipa where there is no differentiation of sepals and petals this is heterochlamidias condition differentiated as calyx and corolla here is another important topic that is called stevation the arrangement of perianth members let it be sepals and petals these are sepals and petals in bud condition is said to be called stevation i repeat the arrangement of perianth members in bud condition is said to be called uh, uh, stevation these stevations are of various types here it is valvate it is twisted these two are uh, imbricate stevations and this is a quinquential stevation let's go and watch uh, this is a valvate stevation where perianth members are close to one another there is no overlapping what such condition is said to be called valvate stevation valvate stevation means the perianth let it be sepals and petals present close to one another and without any overlapping it is said to be called valvate stevation here we can see one margin is overlapping the other margin this is inside outside inside outside inside outside alternately it is present and here also you can see this condition and what this is called twisted stevation you can see it in the case of corolla of hibiscus or even the tura also and this is a vexillary that is called otherwise papillonaceous or otherwise called descendingly imbricate stevation one is completely inside one is completely outside and the rest in twisted manner which means here you are watching the posterior petal is very big and is completely outside and uh, this anterior one is slightly inside completely inside the rest in twisted manner and what this is said to be called otherwise a descendingly imbricate stevation or vexillary stevation in the case of fabaceae members fabaceae corolla papillonaceous corolla 
and uh, this is also imbricate situation what it is otherwise called ascendingly imbricate situation the posterior member is completely inside and the anterior one is completely outside the, which means your overlapping is proceeding from anterior to posterior it's a ascending manner in earlier case in earlier case it is uh, uh, in a descending manner the overlapping proceeds from top to bottom that is in the posterior to anterior hence it is called descending imbricate and this is ascendingly imbricate this is a feature of many cesalpinaceae members and this is a uh, quinquential two are completely outside this is outside this is outside two are completely inside this is inside outside uh, th these two are inside and one is in a uh, of a uh, certain portion is inside and certain portion is outside and what this estivation is said to be called quinquential estivation so my dear viewers thus we have seen the various types of estivations the valvate the twisted the imbricates with the ascending and descending imbricate estivations and the quinquential estivation now we will be seeing the sepals. What are, what are sepals? The horal of sepals called calyx. They protect the flower in their end condition. If the sepals are free, it is said to be called polysepals. If the sepals are united, it is said to be called gamosepals. And here you are watching the various shapes of sepals. And they may be tubular, campanulate, bilabiate, and uh, cupular, spurred, various types of uh, shapes of uh, sepals, tubular in the case of nicotiana, cupular in the case of gossypium, infundibular, campanulate, bilabiate, spurred, and these are the shapes of uh, uh, sepals. And uh, we'll be watching the uh, modifications of sepals also. Here, these colored structures are not petals, these are sepals, and what they're called petaloid sepals. Uh, the original petals are very much reduced and sepals will be taking the part of the corolla. Hence, these are called petaloid sepals. We will be seeing this as an ornamental plant in our houses. It is called muzanda of different colors. And here the sepals are modifying to hairy structures, what it is called pappus. In the case of uh, uh, asteraceae member, this is a disc floret and a florets. There we find the hairy uh, uh, sepals and what it is called pappus, which retain even on the fruit, sipsilla fruit. And sepals will be retaining on the fruit forever. And what such usually sepals will fall off after fertilization. But in certain cases, in the solanacin members, especially like opercicum, solanum, and even capsicum, the sepals will be remaining on the fruit. And what such sepals are said to be called persistent sepals. Now let's move to the corolla. The corolla petals called corolla, which are very quite attractive and attracts the insect at the time of pollination. And they are also, when they are free, it is called polypetals. This is a polypetalous condition. And they are united here. It is said to be called gamma petalous condition. Polypetale and gamma petale, the subclass is there according to the Bentham and Hooker. These are also of various shapes. Caryophyllaceous. This is a cruciform corolla, rosaceous corolla, hypocratory form corolla, the papillonaceous corolla, infundibular corolla. These are all various shapes of corolla you are watching here. And we have to see the go through the examples also. Cruciform in the case of mustard, caryophyllous in the case of dianthus, rosaceous, campanulate, which means bell shaped, and then tubular corolla is also there in the case of disc florets of uh, helianthus, infundibular means which is means funnel shaped in the case of datura, rotate, and so on. The various shapes. And here is one important shape. This is a characteristic feature of papillonaceae and what it is called papillonaceous corolla. Where there is one big petal, what it is called standard, two small petals, what they are called wing petals, two more very small petals called keel petals. And standard wing and keel petals and what this uh, corolla is said to be called papillonaceous corolla, a characteristic feature of uh, Fabaceae. And so on, we have got bilabiate corolla in the case of uh, uh, labiate members, osimum. And uh, these are also, you are watching there on the monitor, the various shapes of corolla. Coming to the, uh, the third horal. First horal or first node is the sepal, second node is the petal and the third node, the female male reproductive structure, the stamen. The horal of stamens is called andrisium. Stamen is otherwise called microsporophyll, the male reproductive structure. Here you are watching on the monitor. This is the uh, stalk-like structure called the filament. This is said to be called the anther. If it is having two lobes, it is called dicticus anther. If ever having only one lobe, it is called monothicus anther. And the two lobes are connected by a, a, a tissue called connective. Inside a, a dithica center will be having the four microsporangia possessing the microspores or otherwise called the pollen grains. It is the male reproductive structure. I repeat the filament, the anther with the anther lobes. 
the statements may be usually uh, three or four or five like that. If ever only one statement is there, it is monandrous. In the case of euphorbia, and there may be two statements or maybe three statements in the triandrous in the case of triticum and tetraandrous four, sta four statements in the case of uh, labiate members. The, usually there may be five statements in the case of solanaceae members and six statements in the case of brassica or otherwise uh, lilium. And uh, we have numerous statements in the case of hibiscus and uh, citrus. So the statement number varies. But how the filament and the anther are attached, that is called fixation, various types. If ever the filament is fixed at the base, it is called basic fixed. On the back of it, it is called dorsi fixed. All along the length on the back, it is called adnate. And at a point, it is said to be called versatile, where the, your anther will be swinging in di different directions and what it is called versatile stamens. We have got the examples, basic fixed, dorsi fixed, adnate, versatile anthers, that is a fixation. And types of andrisium, basing on their length, there are two types. Suppose there are four stamens, two are long, two are short. It is said to be called didynamous, characteristic feature of labiate or lamiaceae. And if there are six stamens, four are long, two short, what it is called tetradynamous. Two are long, two short, two long, two short, four long, two short. This is the characteristic feature of brassicaceae, crucifers, brassica, tetradynamous condition. Yes, fusion of stamens, it is cohesion and adhesion. Fusion among themselves is said to be called cohesion. Let's see here. The stamens unite to form as one bundle and what it is called monoadelphus, feature of a, a Malvasian members and also crotalaria of a Fabaceae member. Only one bundle, it is said to be called monoadelphus. Two bundles, one remains free and the rest nine, overall ten, one remains free and the nine fused to form as one bundle. It's a diadelphus feature of Fabaceae members. You can quote the example of Dolichus uh, and Tephrosia. Numerous bundles are formed uh, that is called polyadelphus in the case of citrus. Here in all these three cases, the filaments are united and the anthers remain free. My dear viewers, filaments united, anthers free. Adelphi, what condition is said to be called? Monodelphus, diadelphus and polydelphus. In this case, this is a case of asteraceae, anthers united and filaments remain free. Hence, it is said to be called syngenesious and feature of uh, uh, what it is called uh, asteraceae members. In the case of cucurbitaceae member, both the filaments and the anthers unite to form as a complex structure and what it is called synandrous. I repeat, in the case of uh, uh, cucurbitaceae, monodelphus, hibiscus, diadelphus, lathyrus, polydelphus, citrus, syngenesious, asteraceae, synandrous, cucurbitaceae members. This is the cohesive nature of the stamens. Now you are watching the adhesive nature of the stamens, where stamens uniting with the, some other horal. Say, for instance, stamens uniting with the petals, it is said to be called epipetals, epipetals, the tura. Stamens uniting with the perianth, where the uh, gyne, where it has not been differentiated as sepals and petals, hence it is said to be called epiphyllus in the case of asparagus. Where the stamens united to the gynesium, it is called gynostegium in the case of Asclepidaceae members, Calotropis. I repeat, this is epipetalus, this is uh, epiphyllus united with the perion, this is united with the gynesium, it is called gynostegium. So, epipetalus, epiphyllus, gynostegium. So, once again, at the end, uh, uh, the stamens dehis and release the polling grains. If they are uh, dehis in a vertical manner, it is called longitudinal, usually in the case of datura. In a transverse manner, it is called transverse, in the case of uh, uh, malvasian members. Through small pores, it is called porous in the case of solanum and through some valves, the, po the spores are released, uh, the microspores are released in what it is called valvular in the case of cassita and ranunculus. Longitudinal, transverse, porous and valvular. Once again, we got the, uh, this is longitudinal, transverse, epical or porous and valvular. This is the connective that connects the two anther lobes. Sometimes this connective is separating the two anther lobes. This is called discrete. And this is called divaricate and this where the two anther lobes are totally separated. In these two, one is fertile, another is sterile. And this is a feature of many Lamiaceae members. Uh, and uh, Salvia is the best example. These are U-shaped anthers or otherwise called distractile anthers, half fertile anthers. These are all the various terms to be used here. So, and uh, it is appearing a hairy structure, what it is called appendix in the case of Nerium. This is the thing related to the connectives. Discrete, divaricate, distractile, and appendiculoid. 
Basing on the stamen and the corolla, uh, there are three terms haplostaminous, diplostaminous, and uh, obdiplostaminous. If the stamen number and the petal number is the same and lying alternating to the petals, stamens alternating to the petals, then this condition is said to be called haplostaminous. What that condition is said to be called? Haplostaminous. And you can see in the case of Datura, if the stamen number is double the number of petals and the outer whorl is alternating to the petals, stamen number is double the number of petals and outer number is uh, what outer whorl is alternating to the petals, it is called diplostaminous case of uh, cassia. And if the stamen number is double the number of petals and outer whorl is uh, opposite to the petals, opposite of it is called obdiplostaminous and the case of citrus, the case of uh, citrus. So thus haplostaminous, diplostaminous, obdiplostaminous and conditions. Coming to the last part of the flower, that is the innermost horal, the gynetium. The horal of carpels is called gynetium. It is otherwise called pistil, otherwise called megasporophyll. It is the female reproductive structure. Having a swollen base called the ovary, elongated structure called the style, and a flattened structure called the stigma. In the ovary, we will find the ovules. If the carpels, uh, these are numerous carpels and they are all free, and what that condition is apocarpus. A carpal possesses the ovary style and stigma and the carpals remaining free and what that condition is said to be called apocarpus. A characteristic feature of primitive members, ranunculus, magnolia, anona, polyaltia and so on. Apocarpus condition. Apocarpus condition means the carpals remaining free which is a very primitive feature and if all these carpels are united, then it's said to be called syncarpus condition, which is an advanced uh, feature. We can see it in the case of solanaceae members, small vasy members. But here is an intermediate stage, what it is called subapocarpus. Watch this. In the case of hibiscus, ovaries, styles united and the stigmas remain free. This is said to be called uh, subapocarpus condition in the case of uh, hibiscus. In certain cases, uh, uh, we can see that uh, in case of linum, the ovaries are united, styles and stigmas are free. Ovaries united, style and stigmas are remaining free. In the case of calotropy, stigmas united, styles united and the ovaries remaining free. So these are various types of uh, subapocarpus conditions. And also you could see one more interesting case. It's called Syngenia in the uh, Lunisera. In this member, ovaries united and the rest of the floral parts are remaining free. And this is all the subapocarpus condition of Malvesi, Linum, Aposinesi members and Lunisera. That is a Syngenian case. Subapocarpus. And a certain portion of the carpels united and certain portion of the carpels remains free. Basing on the position of ovary, if ever hypogynous condition is there, ovary is superior. If ever the epi, epi, epigynous condition is there, ovary is inferior. If ever the perigynous condition is there, the ovary is semi-inferior or semi-superior. Superior, inferior and half inferior. Now, in the ovary, there are ovules. These are all syncarpus conditions. More than one carpel is present. The arrangement of ovules and the placenta of the ovary, the arrangement of the ovules and the placenta of the ovary is said to be called placentation. It is of various types. This is a parietal placentation, axillary placentation, free central placentation. To start with, this is marginal. In a monocarpillary unilocular ovary, all along the length of the ventral suture, the ovules are present. I repeat, the ovules on the ventral suture of the uh, ovary, the best example leguminaceae members, and you can take, the, uh, take it granted, the dolichus. This is a parietal placentation. In a syncarpus unilocular ovary, in a ovary, that may be it's a tricarpillary or maybe a bicarpillary, but there will, there will be only one locule. The ovules are present uh, on the inner walls where the adjacent carpels are fused. On the inner walls where the adjacent carpels are fused and there lies our ovules. And uh, this is the case of uh, cucurbita, whereas this is the case of uh, brassica. With a false septum is formed later on and making it into bicarpillary. Originally it is unilocular. This is a parietal placentation, best examples, cucurbita and brassica. Yes, this is axial placentation. More than one carpel is present. Syncarpus, they, are, they must be united. Because of the fusion of the septa, a central axis is formed. Around this axle, the ovules are present and what it is called axial placentation. Because of the fusion of the septa, a central axis is present and over which the ovules are present. In the case of Malvaceae, Rutaceae, Liliaceae, Solanaceae, etc. This is free central, almost all appears an axial placentation, but the septa are absent. Septa are absent, and what it is called free central placentation, the case of Dianthus. 
a single pendular sobule is present uh, at the base of the ovary it is said to be called basal placentation you could see it in the case of asteraceae so thus you can uh, uh, dear viewers you have seen uh, the various types of placentations placentation means uh, that is arrangement of ovules this is marginal placentation parietal placentation axial placentation free central placentation and uh, basal placentation coming to the style Style is an elongated structure bearing the stigma. If ever it is coming from the apex of the ovary, it is called terminal style. It is a quite regular case, uh, datura. Uh, the style is coming from the lateral side. It is called lateral style in the case of mangifera. The style is coming from the uh, base of the ovary. It is called gynobasic style in the case of leucos, which is a feature of uh, labiate members. Coming to the last among that is a stigma, which, he, which he receives the pollen grains at the time of uh, what it is called pollination. Stigma, if ever it is round, it is called capitate stigma. If ever it is, uh, uh, it is a fork like this, it is called bifid stigma in the case of astracin members. Five stigmas are there in the case of uh, uh, so hibiscus. This is a bilobed stigma in the case of brassicaceae members and a feathery stigma in the case of many uh, poaceae members or isa. So the various types of stigmas to receive the pollen grains. So thus, my dear viewers, in this session, we have seen the various parts of the flower and the number of terms to be used to describe a flower, which are very much required to describe a flower or describe a plant in the process of identification of the plants in, in, in taxonomy. So hope you might have all benefited with this uh, topic of uh, a flower. This is KVS Durga Prasad, Head of Department of Botany, Hindu College. Thank you.